so this is um, lesson two, the royal priesthood and sanctification. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. First Peter 2, 9 through 10. Sanctification, simply described as something that is being used as the designer intended, okay? So in simple terms, I have a daughter who's a professional artist, okay? And she has some very expensive pencils and these pencils are numbered from zero to like, I don't know, four or something. And each one has a different like hardness or softness and they, they can um, be used to make a really beautiful um, drawing, okay? because of their variances in how they put the lead out, okay? Now, if I'm the designer of those pencils and I say, this is for art, that's what I intend it to be used for. Anytime someone is using it to make art, then that those set of pencils are in effect sanctified, okay? But if I took those pencils and I decided to put my hair up in a bun and, you know, put the pencils into my hair so that they could hold my bun, they would not be being used as the designer intended. Therefore, they would not be sanctified. If I threw them in a drawer and I did not use them for art, they again would not be sanctified. Sanctified is only an action that happens when they're being used as the designer intended. So then the question becomes, how did the designer intend for humans to be, okay? God's purpose for a human is for humans to be holy, okay, and set apart. But we need to back up and look at some things in the Old Testament so we can see the consistency of God from the beginning until the end and see what his view of sanctification is, what his view of holiness is, what his view of consecration is, because he doesn't change. We might change the vocabulary. We might change different processes within like the old system and the new system of, you know, Judaism and Christianity, but he doesn't change. So we need to find out what it is that he thinks about sanctification. Okay. To Numbers twenty twelve, and we're going to look at the life of Moses and see what God says about Moses not being sanctified at a certain point in his life and what his consequences are for that, okay? So, um, as a warning, the English translation, you know, it's okay, but I'm going to also dig into the Greek so that you can really see what it says literally instead of just like what we kind of assume to be the English version because our language has changed significantly over the years and we need to just go back to the start, okay? Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land I have given them. This was the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel contended with the Lord and he was hallowed among them. So, Numbers 12, 13. So believe you did not believe me, okay? In the literal, it's a mom and it says, believe me not, having no trust, no faith, to stand fast, to support or to be certain in. And it says to hallow me, that really is sanctify me. So that is to sanctify, consecrate, to be holy, to honor me and set me apart as holy. And then it says, Israel contended with the Lord. Contended is to complain, to quarrel, to wrangle as an adversary. And it says he was hallowed among them. And that is again, sanctified. So to be consecrated, holy, honored, set apart. Okay. So this is a really big deal because Moses did not believe the Lord after seeing everything that happened in exiting Egypt. So then they get to the wilderness of sin and everyone's being drama mamas and like, oh my gosh, we're gonna die, there's no water, la, la, la. Okay, what happened there is completely invisible. It's not in the words. But if you look at the words, you will see the invisible, okay? Moses did not stand up and tell the people, hey, he's brought us this far, it's gonna be okay. 
Okay. Also, when God did provide the miracle and sweetened the water and everyone had all the water they wanted to drink, then Moses was so irritable from dealing with these people, which I totally get, okay? But he was so irritable with dealing with those people um, that he named the place Meribah. Meribah translates to the water of strife. Okay, well, he could have named it something like um, God's Sweetwater Cafe, right? He could have named it something that honored God, but he did not. He was basically naming that honoring their complaining, okay? So the two things he did not do was stand up for God in full faith that God would provide, which he did, and he did not give an honoring name to that place where God did the miracle. So because of that, he's like, sorry, I know you did all this cool stuff with me and I, and you're, you're still like coming to heaven and everything's grand. However, you are not going to the promised land with these folks. That's not going to happen because you, after seeing all the miracles, did not believe me. That's really what he said. Okay. So basically the Lord is saying, I will be sanctified, period. He also expects his people to be sanctified. So the next thing that happens regarding sanctification is very telling. They get to Mount Sinai and they have two days to bathe, wash their clothes, become physically clean so that they can be in nearness to God. On the third day, there was a boundary set up around that mountain and they were told that no one but Moses was gonna be able to cross that boundary. If they did cross that boundary, dead okay so this is a verse exodus 19 10 through 12 go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day for on the third day the lord will come down upon mount sinai in the sight of all the people and you shall set up bounds for the people all around saying take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Exodus 19, 10 through 12. Now, where it says, go to the people and consecrate, that actually is sanctify in the Hebrew. And it says to be made sanctified, to consecrate, to make holy, honored, set apart. Again, same word, okay? Then let them wash their clothes. Wash is to wash a person or clothing to purge from physical dirt by washing and treading underwater. Okay, so this is a physical washing. Why did they have to do all this? Because the Lord himself was coming down. He cannot be in the presence of filth. That's all there is to it, okay? So, okay, so in these few verses, just this little tiny bit, you can see that God has a very strong concept of sanctification and of of his people being sanctified this is like super important to him okay now sanctification is obviously different for god than it is for us because for god he's already sanctified he can never get out of a state of sanctification okay for us we need to get into sanctification so okay so it seems maybe weird to you that like these people all have to take a bath or whatever to be around the entire mountain, okay? But just think about this for a minute. These people have been exiting Egypt for like days, right? You know, it smells like a locker room, the, all of them. They just stink like horrible, I'm sure. So if you were like, for whatever reason, called upon to go meet with a president or a king or the CEO of your company or whatever it is you do, okay? Let's say someone super important you have to have a meeting with them. Are you gonna go like you just did the yard and you're stinky and you're covered in dirt, you're gonna just show up to the meeting? Of course you're not, that lacks respect, right? You would take a shower, get some nice clothes on, you go and prepare yourself to meet with that person, right? That's the same thing that God is trying to teach them. He's trying to teach them the culture of respecting people that are of higher authority, okay? And presenting yourself in an honoring way. So the reason I started here is because often the concept of sanctification in the Old Testament is translated into English in various words, and they all have very overlapping similarities, and they're all related to holiness, okay? So being set apart, being purified, and several other related words, um, they generally mean the same thing, but they are specifically different 
in their context and how they are used. Okay, so here is a little summary of the Hebrew version of the word holy and how it can mean very specific things. Four of them mean holy, one is consecrated, and one is to sanctify, okay? If you take notice, we've got Kodesh, Kodesh, Kadash, Kadesh, Kadesh, and Kadas. So basically, we're looking at a change of a couple of vowels, and that means an entire different thing, okay? It all comes down to set, being set apart, being holy, um, being saints of the Most High, um, being prepared, dedicated, hallowed, stuff like that, okay? Now, the big difference between holy and then consecrated and sanctify, sanctify is really more about setting apart, preparing, dedicating, um, and being clean and holy, okay? The others basically are of things that are holy or they are of people that have already been sanctified and are holy, okay? Now, Kadesh is the root word for all of these, that first one on the left, and the rest of them are um, variants from the word holy. In the Old Testament, often holy and consecrated are also used interchangeably. You understand that Kadesh above, Kadesh, right next to sanctify, it says to be consecrated, but it's all the same basic word, right? So what's up with that? Well, in the Hebrew, there's actually more words that mean consecrate. So let's look at those. So Kadesh, that's to be consecrated in the sense of holiness, okay? Then Sharam is to devote. Nazar is to separate, to be ceremonially dedicated, to separate away from uncleanness and keep clean morally. Nazar is Nazarite um, separation. Male is to fill the hand, to anoint, to consecrate. Milium is filling up or filling to fullness. Okay, so as Christians, we have responsibilities and we need to be sanctified in order to do those responsibilities. So gratefully, we're sanctified by the Holy Spirit, but we are called to leadership as the royal priesthood, as I started out this video with that verse, right? And if only to lead one other person to Christ, our job as a Christian, one of our tasks is to share the gospel, okay? So Romans 15, 16, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So just to clarify, minister means to minister in the manner of a priest. That's our job in priestly service to preach the gospel, to be busy with the sacred things. We're supposed to be busy with church stuff, with Bible stuff, with holy stuff, okay? So that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable. What's the offering of the Gentiles? That's when you convert someone, you bring them to Christianity, and then you offer them up to God. You're like, okay, here's my offering. I'm bringing you this person who now accepts you and understands you, okay? So if we are proper ministers, and we are filled correctly, then that person will be well received, approved, and acceptable because they, why? They will have the background and the verses that are proper. We aren't, this is like in, a, in opposition to people that might be false teachers that are saying, oh, you have to be under the law. Oh, you have to keep the 10 commandments, you know, whatever. Those people are not telling 100% truth. They might be converting people, but they're not converting them to a pure gospel, okay? Then it says um, that those people shall be sanctified, which is the Greek is hagiazo, which is to render or acknowledge as holy, to separate from profane things and dedicate to God, to ceremonially purify, to be free from guilt and sin, purified internally by the renewing of the Holy Spirit, to consecrate the stamp of sacredness from God to wherever it is connected. And then in 1 Peter 2, 5, it says that you are living stones being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So the holy priesthood, holy is holy ones, sanctified, ceremonially blameless, consecrated, physically moral. It's hagios, which is a form of hagiazo, okay? Then we've got the priesthood. That's a, we, are the mem we are members of the priesthood. 
This is the office of the priest, the order of the body of priests, the moral rank of freedom and intimacy that allows Christians to have direct access to God, just as the priests of Israel did in the Holy of Holies, although they were in an isolated number with direct access. We have full access. Okay, spiritual sacrifices. So spiritual is relating to the human spirit, the part of a man that is akin to God, the organ which serves God of the one who is filled with and governed by the Holy Spirit of God, the organ that is regenerated to God and ruled by the Holy Spirit or left wicked and ruled by spirits of wickedness. So the spirit is the actual thing that is choosing to live righteous or unrighteous, okay? To offer up spiritual sacrifices, to offer up is to lead, to bring men to a higher place, to put upon an altar, to place upon oneself. Sacrifices, a sacrifice is a victim, a free gift likened to a sacrifice. Metaphorically though, because we are not under law, we're not supposed to be bringing physical sacrifices. So metaphorically, the, the work of increasing one's faith in providing faith as the sacrifice to be offered to God. So our faith is the sacrifice. You get that? Um, things that are well pleasing to God as a sweet aroma. So the things that we do that are righteous, that's a pleasing aroma to God. That's our living sacrifice. Okay. Then we want to be acceptable to God, right? So this is well received, approved, and acceptable. It's clear to see that the very first Christians in the first century, they were Jewish, okay? They understood everything about the tabernacle, the sanctuary, everything about the old law, okay? We're kind of like fresh and new to it. It seems weird to us, but to them, that was just how you did church, okay? So when Paul says, you're the royal priesthood, they understand, oh, I'm like the priest. I can talk directly to God now, okay? Um, and they already had an established idea of what the sanctification process was for the priests because this was all in the law. So let's do a really brief study on the process of making a priest holy and sanctified in the Old Testament. Remembering that this was set up by God through Moses and Aaron, and I will parallel this with Christianity. Now, another point of reference I'm going to throw in the middle is the anointing of Saul. He was the first king of God's people and he was supposed to be the king of a theocracy. So therefore he needed to have a holy anointing because he was supposed to be like the head of the spiritual nation, okay? Now, by the end of all of this, we're gonna be able to do a little self check and look at the different processes, see where sanctification fits into each of these and then my aim is to help everyone with a sincere heart toward the Lord to be able to verify that they are indeed sanctified, okay? To begin, I feel I need to brush over this whole Old Testament law thing though, because we can't just jump into Leviticus and talk about priests without understanding this, the general concept of the Old Testament law, because it's foreign to us. We are under grace. We don't have the same um, connection to it. So, um, I want you to understand 100%, we are not under law. Romans 6, 14, for you are not under law, but you are under grace. Timothy explains, 1 Timothy 1, 5. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. Also Hebrews 10, 1 points out that the Lord is referring to the 10 commandments and the 613 laws of the old covenant. Listen to this. It says for the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year after year, make those who approach perfect. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin every year. And he said, behold, I have come to do the will of God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. So understanding the old system, which we are not subject to, will help us to bring light upon understanding the new system of grace that we are subject to, okay? So what I'm about to breeze over is really looking at the details of a ceremonial process that we no longer need to do, so do not, do not think that I'm trying to put us under law. I'm not doing that. I'm just showing you an illustration. 
Now we come in the grace door, okay? The rules were for the door of law and people who do not choose grace are automatically under the door of law and they will be rejected because the grace door exists, okay? All right, so hang tight, here we go. Um, I'm not gonna go through every single detail of these charts probably, but um, I have them made in full and you can download them off of the link that's in the description box below. And I will um, try to give you a second at each of the full screenshot and then I'm gonna detail into it. Okay, so let's start with the Ten Commandments because that's like the basics of law, okay? People argue regularly if we are still supposed to be keeping all of the Ten Commandments, okay? To cut to the chase, Jesus fulfilled the need for the law, but God's ideals on how to live have never changed. Jesus came to clarify and modify them because over time the core meaning, which was intended in love, was replaced with legalism. And the obedience of keeping those old laws was for the purpose of legalism. It was not for the purpose of, I love God, therefore I want to obey. It was like, I better obey, otherwise I'll have a consequence. Okay? So, this made it contradictory to God's original purpose, which was he wanted people to, to give from their heart. Okay? So, here's the Old Testament law summarized. And you'll see on the left, we've got the Ten Commandments with each of their, um, where, the, where the basic verse is in the Bible and the summary of it. Um, no other gods, don't make idols, don't use, misuse the name of the Lord, remember the Sabbath, honor your mother and father, you shall not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, and do not covet. Now, Jesus' words, he came and he talked about each of those Ten Commandments and he had things to say. Okay, so in short, I'm going to give you what he has to say. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. No one can serve two masters. Do not swear um, either by heaven or earth because it is God's throne and God's footstool. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Um, God said on your father and mother, you nullify the law with your tradition. Do not murder. If you're angry with your brother, you are subject to judgment. Do not commit adultery. Whoever looks at a woman lustfully, adultery is in his heart. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Um, the devil is the father of lies. His native tongue is lies. That's his deal. Um, from within men's hearts, evil, thoughts of sexual immorality, murder, theft, greed, malice, whatever. Okay, so this all sources from coveting. Those are, Jesus simplifies it all though. So in John 14, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Matthew 22, 37 to 40. But Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the first, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And then Romans reinforces. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all the law is summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore it is the fulfillment of the law. Okay, now there's 613 laws that were in Levitical law, okay? So I'm going to give you a really short seven-point summary for the reason for the Levitical laws, okay? We don't need to get into all the details like, oh, if, you know, this animal's foot is shaped like that, then you can eat it. I'm not going to go that way. But the basic seven ideas are it was a, a medical manual in a primitive time. So what to look for, how to treat it, how to dispose of unclean things, when not to interact with others, how to properly cleanse and wash when wash well, okay? So um, to create a new and distinct culture. There were around 2 million people that came out of Egypt, okay? They were victimized, broken, tired, they're a wreck, psychological mess, okay? They were slaves of a pagan culture. They needed training on how to have a holy and completely different and distinct culture. 
The laws covered all the aspects of cultural life, including food, clothing, farming methods, family life, marriage, government, religious practices. Okay. Now, to create a defined way for unpolluted worship coming out of Egypt, paganism was pretty much all they knew, which is very detestable to God. Teaching the individual rules and rituals was the way to get them to be holy and righteous. They had to be taught how to honor God. We're not that far from there. <laughs> Our people need to be taught how to honor God for sure. Okay, number four, defining acceptable from unacceptable taught discernment. So, pleasing God was said to be done by doing acceptable things and avoiding the unacceptable things. Repeatedly in the laws, they are reminded of lists of things to not be made unclean by. Um, if one was made unclean, they had to go through rituals in order to be able to approach God and be considered righteous, as well as take part in the holidays. To provide mirrors of spiritual truths, symbolism in marriage language paralleled not only God and his people, but also an example of how each member of a marriage should act in a marriage between Israelites. The system of sacrifices also being made holy was for the initial purpose of showing the seriousness of a sin towards God, and it had a secondary purpose of being an anti-type for Jesus, becoming the propitiation for man's sin and abolishing the animal sacrifice system. To introduce a just legal code, um, to place a just theocratic governmental system for a distinct culture. So all the rules are set up Nobody has to really think too much about what do we do, what do we not do, what's right and what's wrong. The judges will compare it to the text. To teach how to properly interact with others. As slaves, they did not have good modeling of how to treat one another. Um, the law clarified expectations for interactions with dignity and respect for all, helping the poor, the weak, the orphan, the widow, the slave, the foreigner, and how to have good, healthy familial interactions and responsibilities. Okay, so this one is going to be 100% helpful if you are reading through the Old Testament. So this is the offerings clarified. And there's little, um, you know, emojis that are um, symbolic of stuff. So the cow is the herd, the goat is the goat, the dove is the dove, the pigeon is the pigeon, the bathtub is the mikvah or the baptism. Um, the grapes are the first fruits, the olive is the oil, the um, wine is a fermented drink. The lamb is a flock, the ram is a flock, the um, wheat is grain, the uh, pita is wafers, the pancakes are cakes, the water is the water of purification. So what I did here is just super simplify the entire bunch of um, offerings that they were required to do. And then I show how Jesus um, fits into each of these, okay? So there's burnt offerings, and I'm going to not read through all of this, okay? But there's burnt offerings, and those were for pleasing aroma to God and atonement for sin. And then Jesus gave himself to be a fragrant offering to God, okay? Then there's the grain offering. This was for Thanksgiving, and it was a pleasing aroma to God. And this was Jesus giving his body um, like bread broken and given, and this still endures it for us in communion. Um, fellowship is the thanksgiving offering completing a vow or ple it was also a pleasing aroma to God so in this one um, we should always give thanks to God through Jesus okay sin offering was atonement for sin unintentional sin doing what is forbidden and then Jesus was sinless God made him sin for us so that we might become righteous the guilt offering atonement for sin forgiveness of sin, unintentional sin, knowing sin, violating the Lord's holy things, doing what is forbidden, dishonest game. The blood of Jesus sprinkled on our hearts cleanses from a guilty conscience and provides atonement still, and this endures our recollection of it in communion. The drink offering is to accompany each lamb offering and a completion of the vows. Um, so Jesus poured out his blood for our salvation, this endures in communion um, as a symbol. Daily, the daily offering for the priest's sins and then for other high priests. And this is, we are to be giving a sacrifice of joy daily, a sacrifice of praise daily, and that we are to live as a living sacrifice daily. So that's our daily um, sacrifice. Then 
the water. This was to purify anything that could not pass through fire and to anoint unto holiness. So this is the same as God's Holy Spirit through Jesus is our water of purification for sanctification effected in baptism. So regeneration, okay? Then they had a mikvah, which is a ritual bath to be ceremonially clean before the Lord. This is baptism in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is for the purpose of forgiveness of sins and receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to leave you to that center section. Um, if you're reading along and you see that they're doing some sort of sacrifice, you can reference this and see what it is that they are talking about. Because it never, the Bible isn't hyper clear where it's like, <clears throat> we're doing a grain offering today. You know, they just say, oh, they offered whatever. And you're supposed to know that because all those people knew that. They knew each of the offerings one from another. Now, why do I have to tell you about the offerings? Because we're going to talk about now the Levitical process, Saul's anointing for the theocracy and Christianity, the preparation for holiness, holiness, sin, and forgiveness and wrath. Okay. So in each section, there are parallels, which are very fascinating. So I'm looking at Exodus 29 Leviticus 8 for the Levitical process, 1 Samuel 9 and following, it goes a couple chapters, and then the New Testament is kind of all over the place, so I couldn't just put a verse on everything, I'll run out of space. First, for the priests. Um, the sacrifice system had not been set up yet, so they do not have anything in that slot, okay? So the first thing they did on day one is Moses gave Aaron and sons a ritual bath. Then Moses dressed Aaron and sons in holy attire. Then he drizzled oil on Aaron and sons heads after the temple had been um, drizzled with oil and purified. Okay. Now sacrifice. After, after this initial part, which is water, clothing, and oil. Okay. Then to make atonement for Aaron and sons to forgive their sins, they had to do a sin offering, a burnt offering, and a consecration offering, okay? Then, after in this process of the second ram, because there's two rams, there's one herd, one cow, and two rams. So the second ram for the consecration offering, Moses places ram's blood on the right of the thumb, ear, and big toe of Aaron and sons. That sounds kind of gross to us, but what he's saying is, I'm here on your right side, okay? Like, I run your... I run your dominant side, okay? I'm the one who's filling that. Then, uh, then uh, Moses did a wave offering and consecrated this on the altar. The wave offering was done with the breast of the ram. Then Moses took oil and blood from the altar and sprinkles this on Aaron and sons and their garments. And then Aaron and sons boiled the flesh at the door of the tent and ate the bread in the basket of consecration. Any undated, any of it that was uneaten had to be burned. Then, here's the thing. They're told to not go outside for seven days. And what? He, who he, God, will consecrate you. So this implies that they had a little um, soft meal and then they fasted for seven days because they're trapped inside. And there's no more food because they burned all up, right? So they're fasting for seven days. Okay, now let's parallel this with Saul, okay? He has a sacrifice on day one because the system of sacrifice has already been set up. So, so he does a fellowship sacrifice. Um, Saul eats the priestly portion of the upper thigh and the sin transfers to the animal in that process. Okay, so basically he's purifying himself from sin. Then there's no record of Saul going through a washing. There's no record of Saul having holy clothes, but there is record of Saul being anointed. Okay, so it says Samuel pours oil on Saul's head and tells him God has anointed him as the commander over the inheritance. And then he gives him instructions. As Samuel turns to walk away, God gives Saul a new heart. Okay, so he's anointed. And as soon as he turns around, boom, he's got a new heart. So the anointing is the thing that changes the heart, okay? Now, the events in his um, obedience, he has to immediately go and obey. Once he has a new heart, boom, his next thing is go and obey, 
okay? So he goes to Rachel's tomb. He sees two men. They tell him some stuff about the donkeys and his dad. Um, then he goes to the Terebinth tree in Tabor, and he sees three men going up to God at Bethel. He meets them. They give him two loaves. Well, that's like the wave offering. They gave him two loaves. And he goes up the hill, and he goes with the prophets, and they have instruments. And he went with them prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on him, and he turned into another man. So first he gets the oil. Then when he turns, his heart is changed. But then the Spirit comes after and turns him into another man. Like he's not just his heart is different, he's completely changed. Okay, he goes down to Gilgal and he has to wait seven days. Well, fasting is implied because unless a rodent runs past and you can catch him real fast, what are you gonna eat? He's sitting there waiting for a sacrifice. The next thing is on his palate is to have a sacrifice. So he waits for seven days. There's two seven days in a row. We've got the Levitical priests and Saul waiting for these seven days. Okay. Then we've got the New Testament. On day one, Jesus is Jesus' sacrifice of his death, burial, and resurrection, and the sins of the entire world are transferred to him. Just like with Saul, the sins of him were transferred to the animal because that's what happens in a fellowship sacrifice if you read the chart. So all of the sins are transferred to Jesus, okay? Then the cleansing and purification phase, okay? So we know that Moses and Aaron had a ritual bath. Saul, we have no record of washing. But we do have baptism in Christianity, right? Okay, then we go clothing. Moses dressed Aaron and sons in holy attire. Saul, we don't have any record of fancy clothes. But us, we are dressed in righteousness and with the armor of God. So if you have got sanctified and consecrated, right? The oil. Our oil is the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is the one who does the sanctifying. We don't have to go to a priest to be sanctified, gratefully. Now, the sacrifice. This process here, it says, already done through Christ, but there are some interesting parallels. Faith spurs obedience. What happened with Saul? This, as soon as his heart was changed, boom, he had to go do tasks. Boom, 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 and then he had his seven days to wait, right? So Christianity, faith spurs obedience. We take the communion, proclaiming his broken body and spilled blood on our, beh our behalf. So that's like the bread that are in both of these. Like the uh, Leviticus has the wave offering and Samuel has two loaves. We are to take communion, proclaiming his broken body and spilled blood on our behalf. We are to examine ourselves against the original measuring stick, which is the Lord. If we, if what we see in our measurement is unworthy, then, and we take communion, it says that this will result in sickness and weakness and us being asleep. I think this is a major problem for the church. People probably take communion, but they're not measuring themselves against God and trying to um, say, well, okay, Lord, help me to become more like you. Just strip away whatever I have and teach me how to be Christ-like. That's what he's wanting. He wants us to have his heart. He wants us to see a person and be like, oh, they're hurting. I'm going to go fix that. I'm going to go help them. Um, some of us have gone through an anointing, okay, which in which we had to either voluntarily or involuntarily fast and um, stay isolated. And after this, we have seen significant changes in our spiritual life God comes down God talks you know it is something okay now let's go on to the eighth day sacrifice because remember these two initial ones there's seven days that they have to wait what happens on the eighth day all right so the eighth day Leviticus Levitical priests Moses calls Aaron and sons um, and the elders to offer Okay, so he has to make some offerings, different offerings, okay? One is for the Levite priests. They've been sitting there for seven um, days. They already had all their sins forgiven and transferred to that one ram, okay? But then it says, for the Levite priests, they have to do a sin offering of a cow, and then they have to do a burnt offering of a ram. Then they have to do a second sacrifice that same day. 
And this is a sin offering of a goat, a burnt offering of a lamb, a peace offering of a bull and a ram, a grain offering of grain and oil. Why? Because it says in that text, for today the Lord will appear to you. Like any sins that you thought of or did or whatever in those seven days while you were waiting, you still need to cleanse again because the Lord is literally coming to camp. That's what he's saying, okay? Let's go back and look at the eighth day sacrifice for Saul. Samuel arrives in Gilgal with Saul and they make a burnt, they make a sacrifice and a burnt offering. Well, that's exactly what happened with the priests. Sin offering, burnt offering, sacrifice, burnt offering, same thing. Um, now, after this fact, then it has like this passing verse that's like everyone can tell he's a new man and he's prophesying among the prophets. So he used to be like an average dude in an average family. He goes through this process and everyone's like, whoa, he's different. He's joyful. He's shining. He's smarter. He's different. Like he's something happened to him. Okay. Now time passes and then Samuel calls Saul to be the king, right? All right. Now let's look at the New Testament. Jesus sacrifices good ones for all. So we don't have to have the eighth day sacrifice because it's already done. Okay. But communion is a similar process for us. The mental examination of ourselves against the standard of Jesus and proclaiming Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and the conquering of death forever. Um, everyone should see that you are a changed person around you. Everyone. They should be like, oh, you used to be different. <laughs> You're a Christian. That's different. Um, as time passes, if you are maturing, you should have a calling on your life. And the Lord will appear to you through an understanding. It doesn't have to be like you hear God and you're writing down some prophecy. He can literally appear while you're reading scripture. You're reading it and you're like, whoa, that stands out to me. I get that. Like that, that's for me, right? You can be worshiping and being like, oh, I get this. Like this is totally different. The Holy Spirit works in different ways at all times so that we are constantly focused on Christ, constantly focused on pleasing God. Okay. Um, so at minimum, there should be a changed life. Okay. Now, if you are impressed upon to fast for seven days, I'm not saying you have to, that is not in our rules of the new covenant at all. I'm just saying as a person who has done that, it's a significant time of that eighth day, the Lord appears, I'm telling you. <laughs> but, okay, so what happens after that sacrifice? They have their eighth day sacrifice. They do what they're supposed to do in the Levitical um, priesthood you know, ceremony. And then boom, fire comes down and takes the burnt offering and the fat off of the altar. Boom, like that, gone, gone. Then the people were so freaked out that they shouted and they fell on their faces. They're like, ah! <laughs> in Samuel, we have no record of anything of the Lord specifically coming down. Okay. In the New Testament, we receive the Holy Spirit in the sanctification and baptism phase. And as we are receptive, God will reveal more and more of himself to us until we draw near to him in reading his word with prayer and with worship. See, he manifests himself more slowly to most Christians now, um, but that's okay. He still manifests himself and we understand him fully, but you can't understand him without reading his words. It's like, I don't even think that's possible. Okay, then we've got what happens next. So the Levitical priests were supposed to do two sacrifices, one for the priest's sins and then the second one for the people's sins, but they didn't get to the second one. They did the first one. God came down in, in fire and freaked the people out and took the sacrifice from them. Boom, gone. Okay, now, then as they're preparing to do this, the sacrifice for the people, um, Nadab and Abihu, which are Aaron's sons, um, offered a profane fire. That is identified in the Hebrew as offering to an idol. Okay, before the Lord. So they didn't fully get rid of the things that they learned in Egypt. And they're like, you know what? We're going to do this. After everything they've been through, they still chose that. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them 
and they died on the spot. And then the Lord spoke and he said, those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. Leviticus 10, 3. Okay, now, the priest's sin, there was a dramatic, um, dramatic, dramatic reaction by God, right? Boom, dead. You just swallowed up in fire. Now, what happens next? The dead are removed. Aaron's cousins remove the dead out of the camp. And then instructions are given to the house of Israel. Do not uncover your heads, meaning mourn. Do not tear your clothes, meaning mourn bitterly. Or you will die and wrath will come to all the people. Like, this was a holy and just thing. They were doing something super wrong and they died. Don't mourn about that. That's that's not having the heart of God because God's ticked off. He's like, you're offering me like a sacrifice to Baal. Are you kidding me? Right? All right. Then um, do not go out of the door of the tent. So there, he's like, nobody leave the building. And or you will die. Why will they die? For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. Every single person that was there had the Holy Spirit on them. The anointing oil of the Lord. And he's like, don't leave here or you're going to die because it's too much. Okay. Let's look at what Saul's process was. Saul sinned by doing an unlawful sacrifice. This is exactly what Nadab and Abihu did, by the way. Okay. Saul sinned by doing an unlawful sacrifice to himself before Samuel came. He didn't wait long enough for Samuel to come to do it in the proper ritualistic way. And he and 600 men did this so that he could win against the Philistines. Okay. So when Samuel does show up, he says, what have you done? And Saul's like, oh, I felt compelled to, you know, you didn't show up on time. And then Samuel's like, you have done foolishly. Like, I don't even know what to say. So Saul makes a rash oath. Then Saul is like praying to God, like, okay, I don't hear you. I feel bad. I, I haven't heard from you lately. Um, can you, can you, you know, talk to me? And all he hears is crickets, nothing. He's not hearing anything. The Lord did not answer him that day. So Saul asked the people what their opinion was. He's like, well, if God's not going to talk to me right now, I'll get counsel from the people that I trust. Okay. So he followed the people's advice instead of waiting for the Lord's advice. Then he violated the Lord's command. He violated the Lord's instructions. And he did all of this. Why? Because the people wanted an answer right now. He had fear of men. He wanted the men to approve of him because he wasn't going to say, um, I'm going to wait until the Lord tells me. I don't know. He wanted their opinion. He wanted their approval. So Saul sinned against the Lord again by not killing the king of Agag. Now, all of these sins come in different phases, but what happens is the first one kind of triggered the second and the third and the fourth because once he started sinning, he starts cycling down, okay? Now, all of us make mistakes and we are imperfect. And Christianity... Uh, um, even though in God's eyes we're justified, it's not a license to sin. So if a Christian finds that they have been offering a profane sacrifice, a profane fire by idol worship, um, not regarding God as holy, not glorifying God, they have violated the Lord's commands or instructions. Um, they regard men's opinions over God's opinions. They're not obedient. They consult paganism for help. Um, they should immediately seek forgiveness in humility. Do not keep on sinning like Saul because it drags you deeper and deeper and deeper. Okay. After sinning, reconsecrate yourself to the Lord and get your heart and mind right by reading the scriptures and staying in worship. So basically you're just going to do the same thing you did when you came to Christ. You're going to just flip your life around and head the other direction. You're going to head the correct direction now. Okay, so remember in Leviticus where um, Aaron's cousins removed the dead out of the camp? Well, our dead is like sin, right? So Saul asks for forgiveness for his sins to the Lord, okay? So that he can worship the Lord. He's like, I miss you, God. I want to, I'm so sorry. But you know what? His heart was impure because it says that he also wanted to keep his job. He was like, I'm so sorry, Lord, I want to talk with you and everything, but you know, I don't want to lose the king thing. I want to make sure I still stay king because this is really cool. 
Um, this shows that he felt disconnected from the Lord because of sin. So who moved? Saul moved. He should have done what was right. He moved. Then he felt disconnected. Then he still had his heart wrong, right? Because he's like, I just want power, okay? But then he also did not have those honest motives of, of being humi humble, okay? Like, I don't care what it is. Take the job away if that's what it takes. All I care about is pursuing you. That's what he should have done, but that's not what he did. Okay, so in the New Testament, if we sin, um, we're supposed to kill the sin by requesting the Holy Spirit to give us the power to immediately change and take it out of your life and make a decided choice to allow this to happen. Instead of sinning, instead of making those choices again and again and again like Groundhog Day, focus on scripture, worship, righteousness, and holy living. The house of Israel was given instructions because they had the Holy Spirit on them and not to mourn for the loss of these people who were sinning, okay? So this is what happened with um, Saul and Samuel. Samuel told Saul to obey is better than sacrifice. Rebellion is as bad as witchcraft. Stubbornness is as bad as idolatry. Because you rejected the word of the Lord, he is rejecting you as king. Ouch. Okay, for us, don't overly mourn. Yes, you should feel bad and remorseful. Like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. That, that was probably not the best. And then you should quickly repent and turn from that behavior. Submit it to the Lord and say, okay, help me not to do that. Um, and from the active, stay away from the activity or whatever got you to the point of that activity. You might have to stay clear of a whole bunch of things in order to avoid that activity. Um, but don't stay in the sin because then it just moves you farther and farther and farther away from God. And then it keeps you spiraling, spiraling, spiraling in sin, right? Now, should you feel bad about the crimes that you've committed? Yes. But once you come before God and say, forgive me, please, I'm really sorry, and help me to figure this out, then you should not continue on with like kicking yourself in the gut. Because grace, grace wipes away those sins, right? So yes, you should feel some remorse, but you should not be beating yourself over the head with it. You should be like, okay, moving on. Let's go forward and let's not think about the past, you know? Um, so don't rebel in stubbornness either, okay? Now, after all of this with the Levitical priesthood, they take the dead guys out. God tells Aaron, do not drink wine or intoxicating drink, you and the sons, when you go into the tent of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute through your generations that you may discern between the holy and the unholy and clean and unclean, and that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken of them by the hand of Moses. Okay, so he's, you know what that tells us? The sons had been drinking and then they made the choice to offer false worship, okay? Now, what does that mean? Is there any parallel for Saul? After Samuel died, um, Saul wanted counsel. So he consulted a witch or a medium to speak to the spirit of Samuel and bring him forth so he could talk with him. Um, he hears that he will lose his kingdom and his sons will die the following day. He laid prostrate and fasting in fear. He's like, oh no, I made a really big mistake. Okay, so he's spiraling and spiraling and spiraling. He finally goes to like the local witch. That That's pretty far down there. You have gone to the other side, sister. <laughs> like that's not good. Now, what happens? Saul dies in battle. That's his, that's his end. He never fully repents that we read about, okay? Now, what about Christians? Le Levites in the Old Testament were the leaders of the spiritual health of the nation of Israel because it was a theocracy. Much like we are the royal priesthood, we are supposed to be leading others into spiritual health by bringing them to Christ, okay? So we need to take that calling very soberly. We need to be honoring and glorifying to God and we need to not be under the influence of physical or spiritual intoxicants, but we need to come to this process with a sound mind, okay? Now, 
After Aaron is told this about not being intoxicated or they're going to get, you know, dead, then it says the non-sinning are employed, meaning um, Aaron had other sons, okay? And they didn't all do this. So the ones that were not sinful, they still had gone through the holiness process and all. Um, these are Eleazar and Ithamar. And um, they went to make the offering for the people of Israel. Make the grain offering, make the remaining offerings, eat without leaven besides the altar, um, eat it in the holy place, because Aaron and sons are supposed to eat that particular kind of sacrifice in the holy place. But Aaron did not complete the eating of the offerings because he felt he would have been seen as unrighteous because the time gap with the ritual had a glitch that the blood was brought inside. He's like, you know, there was a, the time passed because we had to deal with all of this, you know, pe dragging these people out and we got to hear from the Lord and we had all this distraction. So we didn't do it exactly perfect. And if I eat of this, I could die. So all of a sudden, Aaron gets it. He's like, um, whatever we're doing here is really serious. Okay. So, um, what happens when Saul's story is Saul's dead. So now what? Well, David's made the king. They brought in a new person who's not sinning to lead the people. Okay. So David, although not flawless, is an example of what excellence is as God sees it. Okay, so when he makes mistakes, he turns around. He's like, so sorry. Oh, mm, mm. I'm going to shoot after holiness. Okay, I'm going to read, you know, Psalm 119. He reads the law like crazy man. Okay, um, God uses him in a mighty way. And he's the antitype for Jesus being the king of Israel. So he's the first, you know, image of that. Then we got the New Testament. Jesus is the sacrifice for all of our sins. But clearly God shows it is about what? The heart not about like rules, okay? So God uses the people that will not profane his name. So let's say you're a Christian, but you're kind of not living the best, that's profaning his name, okay? So he's not gonna use you. He's not gonna give you like dreams and words and all these different things to do because you're embarrassing to him. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. So the people that are doing what they're do supposed to be doing, they will be used by the Lord. Now, understand and obey the instructions for obedience and holiness. So um, in the New Testament, we are to have the heart. We, we should have the want to, to understand and obey the instructions for obedience and holiness. Okay. As said by Jesus. Now we are to be sure to take a reverent attitude towards worship. You have to see God as God. He's not your buddy. He's not your pal. He's not like, Hey God, how's it going? He's God. Okay. This is serious business. So let's look at what the bottom line is for each of these, okay? When in Leviticus, the sons rebelled with idols, they died immediately. And that was why, to set a precedent. That if you're going to be around God, you have to treat him with respect. This is about holiness, okay? Then with Saul, he was never sanctified. If you look back, he never went through any water. He never got any special outfit to wear, okay? He was never sanctified. The Lord stopped speaking with him when he started on the sin, sin spiral down, okay? He's like, mm, that's it. You're being an idiot. I'm out. And he continued to sin until he consulted a witch and he died. Now, he wasn't sanctified. Thankfully, we have the opportunity to be sanctified. So Christians are sanctified, should they follow the directions. Can they choose to worship idols or is the one who switches teams not really a Christian? We're going to deal with that in one of these other um, videos, okay? The biggest thing I see with all of the rituals is priests are to be honoring and reverent to God. That's you, you're a priest if you're a Christian honoring and reverent to God, set apart physically, morally, and spiritually to be used how God sees fit, seeking after holiness and righteousness with a pure heart to please the Lord, and obedience to whatever God requests without selfish motive. We don't want to be like Saul and be like, I will obey, but I really want what I want. No, you have to be like, whatever you want, God, I'm in, whatever it is.
It appears that in the Levitical ceremony that sanctification occurs with consecration. If you went back and you look at that chart, here's in the Levitical ceremony that sanctification occurs with consecration in the original language, okay? One is set apart and a form of holy water is washed over them or they are washed in it. There in the obedience, God honors this and he is the one who does the sanctifying, okay? Now understand that the Greek texts of the Old Testament were written much earlier than the Hebrew ones, okay? And I decided to take a peek at the words to see if there's anything significant. And lo and behold, in this process, the priestly sanctification and consecration, there was an astounding discovery. So check this out. Numbers 8, 7 in the English New King James Version. Thus you shall do to them to cleanse them, sprinkle water of purification on them, and let them shave all of their body, and let them wash their clothes, and make themselves, and so make themselves clean. So, in the Masoretic text, the Hebrew transliteration, it says, And thus shalt thou do unto them to cleanse them, sprinkle water of purifying, and let them shave all of their flesh, and let them wash their clothes, and so make themselves clean. Okay, so clean is to hair, which is to be bright, to be pure, to be Levitically uncontaminated morally, and pronounced clean. Okay, so this like shaving and washing process was about being uncontaminated morally, the, even though you're not shaving off anything moral, it's just the process of it, okay? So the Greek transliteration of the Septuagint is in this manner performed to them the counted. Who? The counted? Okay. In this manner performed to them the counted the ceremonial water of purification and comes the Holy Spirit influence and let them shaved all things on the human body and him, the counted, the flowing robe, upper garment, and they will be clean. So basically they get the water of purification and that allows the Holy Spirit to influence. Then they get to shave, then they get the fancy outfit. Okay. Now, the um, interesting thing about clean in the Greek is, is kathros, which is pure, clean, and chaste. But it has three definitions, which are super interesting. One is physically purified by fire. Okay. Two is Levitically clean, and the process imparts no uncleanness. And three, ethically clean from corrupt desires and mixing with all falsehoods, free from all sin and guilt. So those three are very consistent with our understanding of being um, saved by grace through faith, right? Okay, so this is super fascinating. Now I want you to understand while we're under while we're exploring this Levitical law and remember that all things in the temple that were used in the temple, those things were considered to be in God's presence because that was the Holy of Holies and anything used in that area was in God's presence, okay? Now, like the priests or any implements used, those had to be purified to be in God's presence, right? Now, um, in Numbers, it talks to us about an interesting little tidbit about how the um, ordinances and laws of Levitical law um, related to things that the Israelite people might have won a war and then they get to keep certain things from those people like, you know, gold cups or whatever. And um, it talks about the process of how they have to be purified. Check this out. Levitic or Numbers 31, 21 to 24. Then Eleazar, the priest, said to the men of war who had gone to battle, this is the ordinance of law, which the Lord commanded Moses. Only the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, the tin, and the lead, everything that can endure fire, you shall put through fire and it shall be cleaned. And then it shall be purified with water of purification. But all that cannot endure fire, you shall put through water. And you shall wash your clothes on the seventh day and be clean. And afterwards, you may come into the camp. So, so clearly as humans, we cannot go through literal fire, okay? Without death or massive injury. So this is the reason God set up the purification of water for the priests and the reason he sets up baptism in the church because we're not intended to go through fire for purification, but we need to go through purification. 
to be in his presence. The process of sanctification or the setting something apart to be dedicated for use for the Lord, like the implements and things inside the Holy of Holies, clearly must involve a step of cleansing in order to be considered sanctified and holy. Interestingly, on the day of Pentecost, when the church was established, fire came down on the people, right? In essence, they were passing through fire in order to be sanctified. But at the end of Peter's sermon, he also tells them the very next thing to do is go through water. So that's exactly the same as the Levitical law, fire then water, okay? So here's the verses, Acts 2, 3. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. So appeared is to perceive with the eyes, to behold, to experience, to be a partaker and become acquainted with. Come upon ex unexpectedly. So this was a physical thing they all saw. This is not just like, um, oh, you know, they thought it was that. No, this is real. Okay, then fire is literal fire. It says fire, the heat of the sun, fire of God, and the fiery flame of fire. This is like the fire of God came on them. Okay, this is the same as the priests when the fire came down and took that sacrifice. Then we've got sat upon, to make sit down on two, to rest upon, to arrive upon above. So this fire is above them. Okay, and then each is each and every one distinctly. So every single person in there had the Holy Spirit on them, just like in um, the Levitical process when God says, don't you leave this building, any one of you, because you have the Spirit of God on you, and if you leave, you're going to die, right? So this is the Spirit of God coming on people, okay? Then Acts 2.38, Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, repent, which is to change one's mind for the better, to stop and reverse action, going in the exact opposite direction and turning from sin with contrition and submission to God, which is the proper condition to receive divine forgiveness. Um, to be baptized is to be immersed, submerged, washed. It's parallel with a mikvah. It's a ritual cleansing. For is EIS, which is for the purpose of, to be in two into what baptized into the purpose of remission of sins what's remission from the imprisonment it's the pardon for a legal penalty what so to be baptized pardons you from that why well because of regeneration from the holy spirit so from sin sin is to miss the mark to wander off the path of righteousness by violating god's law and then and then you shall receive the Holy Spirit. So receive is to take, to choose by selecting a thing, to take with the hand of a person or a thing in order to use it, to take upon oneself as to carry. So you're going to take the Holy Spirit and be parallel. You're going to always and forever have that with you. Okay. Now, just connecting the dots for you. At the end of time, those that are left on this earth and are unrighteous, they will pass through fire because it says, when they, they are going to be taken out by a flash of fire from heaven, Revelation 29. And they will be melted, Isaiah 38, prior to their souls being able to be in God's presence for their judgment, Revelation 20, 13, and eventually sentenced to eternal fire, Revelation 20, 15. But they could literally not go before God to be judged if they did not go through the process of fire sanctification, basically fire cleansing, okay? This holds consistent to the Levitical law. Why? Because God is holy and to be honored and to be glorified, Leviticus 10.3, just like he told the priests. Their judgment is eternity in hell, people who are living in unrighteousness. Why? Because they rejected grace. They chose to stay under law, okay? Therefore, they have to be measured against the law, 1 Timothy 1.8 and Romans 3.20. So in Matthew 5.20, Jesus reminds the people that their righteousness would have to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, which is an impossible feat, for they could not enter the kingdom of heaven. By living in unrighteousness, they fail before they begin. Those under grace who have taken actions in faith 
to be sanctified have gone through water and the cleansing part of the sanctification process is complete and the Holy Spirit, arguably the fire of purification, and this regenerates and renews them. But the cleansing and regeneration or sanctification is complete, allowing them to be able to be before God. Do you see the connection? Um, from Genesis to Revelation, it's completely consistent. Now, not to weird you out, but most of you know that the Lord has set our family apart for use and I have had some pretty unique um, spiritual experiences, right? Um, I have died, gone to heaven, been before God and Jesus. Um, I have been brought back to life here on earth. Two of my family members have died and come back to life, like in my immediate household. Um, we also can see angels. We can see things behind the veil. Um, we just don't really have a typical um, experience probably of, of life, but... This is for purposes that um, are up to God, right? I, I never asked for any of this or chose any of this. This is just how, you know, life has happened in our world, in our little, like, you know, little world. Now, I was told back in November of 2022, after I finished that whole section of um, downloads that I got from the Lord, and then I had that long break. In that time period, I was told the very beginning of that, when I was just exhausted, beyond exhausted, to do major deep cleaning of our house um, our physical home because um, as if we were moving okay and now to me that might be a different level than you but to me that's like toothbrush to the um, baseboards and sort through everything you own and throw out half of it and like it's a very deep cleaning that we do for that process touch up paint the whole deal okay so I was exhausted but I did just that I told the girls okay this is what we're doing and we all did it so as we were going room by room and um, completing each thing, we were given eyes to see that everything that we had cleaned got a um, invisible to most, but visible to us covering that kind of draped over each thing that we had cleaned. So that told us, I prayed about it and asked about it, that told us that our house, everything that we had touched and done had become sanctified and protected and considered holy. That's kind of wow, right? So this would not have occurred though if I would have been like, I'm too tired, I can't do this. And it wouldn't have happened if I didn't just obey. If I said, why, why should I do this? It, I had none of those thoughts. I just said, okay, the Lord told me to do it. I'm gonna do it. I don't care how I feel about it. I don't care how tired I am. I'm just gonna muscle it out, okay? So if I say, why, why should I do that? I mean, what's physical cleaning up your house have to do with anything? then that's equal to me challenging God and saying, well, I am I need to know why. I'm better than you or I'm equal to you. I don't feel that way, so I would never think like that. But it's a serious amount of pride if you want to take God on and be like, well, why do you think that? Think about that. That's serious. Okay, so back to sanctifying people. This blind obedience, because we trust the one who gives the instructions, is the same for the Christian. Okay. The Bible is clear. The people are to be baptized. But in our generation, many find this an unnecessary step of obedience. They hang their belief on the, it says if we believe we're saved, right? Theology, which is true. But you can't throw out the rest of the Bible and be like, well, you know, these verses over here don't count. Just the believe part and have faith part count. So, um... Faith riding upon grace is the agent for justification, okay? The water doesn't save you, but the process of obeying, in that process, God allows the Holy Spirit to sanctify through the power of the blood of Jesus. It's like a test. If you say you believe and you're like, oh, I believe, and he's like, will you follow my instructions? Or will you listen to what the other's opinions are on the topic? Hey, my pastor said I only have to believe. I don't really have to be baptized, right? I mean, that's what we're talking about. So um, those, now remember those words I received, they were so clear. Those left behind for the war, pre-rapture, but post the anointed leaving, are left behind because they are not sanctified. So clearly this related to that step of baptism and then continuing on in righteousness. 
So those two are not inseparable. You have to be able to say, I'm baptized, therefore I live righteously. You can't be like, I just live like, you know, any criminal. I, I was baptized because it's not about the water. It's about the heart. Okay. So when you choose to get baptized, you're making a public declaration that you will be now a different person. Like Saul. All noticed he was different. All. Everybody. Okay. And we are to be set aside for use by God in any way he sees fit. So you're like, I've always wanted to be a doctor. And God's like, you know, I really want you to be a lawyer. Dang it, you better be a lawyer. That's what I'm hearing. Okay. <laughs> I don't think, you know, those are either one. But I'm just saying, you need to follow the directions, whatever they are. Um, as humans, we do not and cannot sanctify ourselves by the act of baptism or good works or, or faith or anything else. Okay. It is clear the father sanctifies by the spirit in the name of Jesus. Okay. First Corinthians one thirty. but of him, you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom of God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Second Thessalonians two thirteen. but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you brethren beloved by the Lord because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth first Corinthians 6 11, and such were some of you but you were washed but you were sanctified but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of God Hebrews 10 10 by that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You see, by our obedience to the step of baptism, we are agreeing to accept the sanctification, agreeing to be set apart and used by the Lord as he intended. In essence, we're agreeing to join the new covenant of grace offered by the Lord, okay? And all that it entails, you can't just cherry pick and have a buffet Christianity. It's the whole package. Okay. You get the benefits, but you also get the responsibilities. Notice in second Thessalonians two thirteen, some strong, strong language. It said, choose you for salvation through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth. This means belief alone will not sanctify. But you must put yourself in a situation to receive the spirit sanctification. That situation is purification of water. Okay. Now also notice in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, it has the three steps and they're in a certain order. It says one, you were washed, two, you were sanctified, three, you were justified. This is the identical order of the Levitical priesthood ceremonial rituals. They were washed, they were sanctified, and then they were finally justified after fasting and the second sacrifice. Gratefully, Christ died for us once for all. We don't have to do the second sacrifice part, okay? But justification is a result of actionable faith that brings us through sanctification. You see, so yes, you're saved by faith alone, but that faith is intended to be an action. Faith spurs on a wanting to please the Lord pleasing the Lord spurs on more faith that takes you in and out and in and out and in and out of the more you obey the bigger your faith the more Here is sanctified holy and consecration in um, the Greek so there's hagios which is the root word and that's basically holy but it, look it says consecrated set apart exclusively God's morally upright under the influence of the Holy Spirit then there's hagnos which is ceremonially free from defilement. There's hagi, which is the prefix, and then all those other um, suffixes mean slightly different things, but basically like action words and stuff. But look at there, sanctification, consecration, dedicated. Okay, um, there's hagiozo, which is sanctified. So to acknowledge as holy, to separate from profane things, to free from sin and guilt, to make holy, to dedicate to God, selected for his service. Then there's a um, kinizo, which is to dedicate and make new, and teliu, which is to make perfect. Now, the definition of sanctified um, in the Hebrew and the Greek is pretty much identical, okay? 
Even though sanctification happens by the Holy Spirit because of, or as the agent is baptism, it's not a license to sin. Um, you can't say, hey, I took a bath, now I'm sanctified, and now I can just live however I want to live. I can just go party and, you know, sleep around and do whatever I want to do. We'll get into those consequences in a different video, but you can't do that, okay? Interestingly, sanctification also is not 100% passive. Romans declares that after baptism, we are to be dead to sin and walk in newness of life. It says Romans 6, 3 to 7. Or do you not know that as many of you as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. That newness of life is called walking in the spirit. And it is essential to righteousness. Remember, if you're not righteous, you can't go to heaven. Okay. So Romans 8, 9 through 10. But if you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin and the spirit is life because of righteousness. In the spirit, now the spirit is the third person of the Trinity. Okay. So being in the spirit is um, within which something operates. So you're operating your entire life within the Holy Spirit, okay? Um, which dwells in you, which is to make a home, to reside, okay? Now, what does it do? The Spirit is life. Wait till you check this out. Life is from and sustained by God's self-existent life, true and full life with the capacity to know eternal life, genuine life, of those that are partakers of life after resurrection into immortality. Now then it says, um, because of righteousness. Because of is dia, so meaning on the account of righteousness, for the sake of righteousness, the quality that brings the means to the end. Um, and then righteousness is a judicious approval, divine righteousness of God who is the author. Um, that which is deemed right by the Lord and approved in his eyes. So then we've got Romans 9, 16. So now present yourself, present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Slaves is a bond slave. That's not the same as a kidnapped slave. Okay. This person willfully decides to live under someone else's um, shelter and they obey everything they say and they do everything because they are basically giving up their life to be a slave for this person, okay? It is one who gives themselves up wholly to another's will. Used in the Bible of apostles, prophets, God's true worshipers, teachers, and preachers. And again, it goes into EIS 4, for the purpose of sanctification, which comes back to that consecrated, set apart, everything, okay? Romans eight fourteen. And 16, for, um, for as many are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So to be led is a go, which is to bring, to lead, to carry. To bring a person to a place by accompanying them. To impel and influence, to lead by one attaching oneself and bringing them to the point of the destination to guide and direct to impel by forces and influences of the mind so the holy spirit is attached to us and drags us along where to the end where's the end heaven okay first corinthians 6 9 do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of god do not be deceived Romans 8, 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit on things of the Spirit. According to means um, down from or with regard to, equivalent to being face-to-face -face with, using as a standard of measurement. So if you're using the Holy Spirit as your standard of measurement, then you are 
living according to the spirit. But if you're using the world as your standard of measurement, you want to have the big house and you want to have the um, approval of all the people around you, then that's living according to the world. Okay. Now it says set the mind, set their minds on things. So either in a positive way or a negative way, someone is setting their mind, right? So that is to have an understanding and be wise about to direct one's mind to think about, to strive after. So if you're striving after becoming like the world, then that's not living in the spirit. If you're striving after living in the spirit, you're not striving after the world. You can only have one or the other, okay? Now, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who do not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. According to is an interesting word. It, it means to come down from a higher to a lower plane or to come down through. Talking, So it's talking about people who are living down through the spirit okay so the holy spirit is above us and has more wisdom than us and we live down through the holy spirit okay galatians 5 22 but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace um long suffering kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control against such things there is no law and those who are christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires if we live in the spirit let us also walk in the spirit how do you walk in the spirit kata to properly walk to keep in step with as if in the line of a rank like you know like a military rank okay to walk in the same cadence as to direct one's life under the control of or according to the rule of something what's the rule of the spirit so you're walking in step with the holy spirit exactly whatever it, it directs you left right straight that's how you go Clearly, we can quench the Holy Spirit, though, and grieve the Holy Spirit by not doing this. By not doing what? Walking in the Spirit, okay? Or we can obey, and we can be instruments of righteousness for the Lord. And living in righteousness that we have been told leads into holiness. There is an element of autonomy in this process, free will, okay? So it says, Ephesians 4.30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Well, if you didn't have any free will, that statement doesn't even need to exist. Not for you. know, like, it doesn't make any sense that there's no free will involved. Okay? So do not grieve the Holy Spirit by that statement itself proves there is free will. You can grieve the Spirit. Okay? So grieve is to cause heaviness, grief, sorrow, to cause a scruple, a hesitation regarding a course of action, regarding the morality of things. Don't cause the Holy Spirit to wonder if you're moral, to wonder if he made a good choice in helping you to become saved. You see? Um, by which you are sealed. By is through or upon which, whereby. Sealed is to, to set a seal upon to mark with a seal to confirm or authenticate beyond doubt okay then it says first thessalonians 5 19 do not quench the spirit quench is to be um to put out a fire or to extinguish to stifle divine influence do not stifle the lord if he's talking to you and you're like nah that can't be no you do it you listen um, sometimes uh, you might be convicted, like I should go talk to that person. You know, they they probably need the Lord, and then you're like, mm, I'm not going to do that. That's stifling the Holy Spirit. And let's say you get a dream, and it's potentially prophetic, and you're like, mm, uh, I've been told that um, prophecy, you know, ended in the New Testament. Well, you're stifling the Holy Spirit because he's giving you a dream. What you do with it next will determine if you get any more. Okay. Um, 2 Peter 1.10 Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. So give diligence is to exert oneself diligently to make haste, urgently progress to make it sure is to make stable the foundational level to be steadfast and Im unimmovable. Um, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness 
and from the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. To cleanse is to purge, um, purify, remove by cleansing, to consecrate, and to pronounce clean Levitically. For real? Yes. Filthiness is defilement, immorality, um, actions by which anything is stained or defiled. Perfecting holiness. So perfecting is to bring to an end, to accomplish, to execute, to terminate, to its finish. Romans 6, 13. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. Instruments is weapons or tools to wage war. We are supposed to be fighting a spiritual war constantly. And if you're not, you need to get on board because that's our job as Christians. God wants us to be instruments of righteousness. He wants us to fight for what is holy. How do we cleanse ourselves and present ourselves as instruments of righteousness? How do you do this? Psalm 119 11. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Hidden is to store up, to treasure, to hide, to reserve. Okay. Ephesians 5, 8b, 10, and 11. Walk as children of the light, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and have no fellowship with the works of darkness, but rather expose them. Finding out means to test metals, to prove for purity. Um, and approve after testing, to recognize after an examination that a thing is worthy. It's supposed to be digging and trying to find what is acceptable to the Lord. That's what that's what part of your job is in the Bible. That's where all the answers are. Second Timothy two fifteen. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Diligent is to eagerly, zealously hasten. To show full diligence, conscientiousness, attentiveness, perseverance, commitment, to tirelessly work hard, the quality to do one's work well and thoroughly with careful persistence. 1 Corinthians 15 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Romans 2 10. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, peace is peace of mind. Properly, it is of wholeness. When all the essential parts are joined together, there is peace. Um, God and the person walking in the spirit is God's, gets God's gift of wholeness, which brings peace through all circumstances. Work what is good. A lot of people like to turn this one, and this is, you know, from the mothership of catechism where people are like, you have to do all these works or you're not going to get in heaven. That's not at all what this says. Check it out. Works what is good. To search and examine, to work, to acquire by labor, to practice and perform one's trade, labor, to minister about, to labor towards things that originate from God, like kindness and good things living one's life empowered by God through faith, inherently good things. So in short, doing good works for those that are sanctified is the natural outpouring of inherently good things that God gives us. So anyone that's truly saved, everything they do is basically a good work. These good works do not earn you into righteousness. They are righteous acts that spill forth from being one of God's children that's in obedience because you're taking in the Bible, you're taking, you're walking with the Holy Spirit. What you give out is joy. What you give out is love. What you give out is the gospel, okay? Those are good works, but they're natural outpourings. You don't need to go find, um, you know, a homeless shelter to sign up for or you don't go to heaven. That's, that's not the gig, okay? Romans 2, 7. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. Eternal life is perpetual, unending, real, and genuine, perfected, the perfected life after the resurrection, the promise of the hope fulfilled. Patient is hupomone, remaining patient and steadfast while waiting within difficulties. Good are actions carried out by internal desires that are inherently and intrinsically good that originate from God, the works that are empowered by faith 
and by the leading of God and the Holy Spirit. And then the glory is um, praise, glory, uh, praise and glory of what invokes a good opinion that is inherent worth of splendor. Honor is a perceived value of valuing of a value assigned to something. Seeking is to search for a demand, um, getting to the bottom of the matter, inquiring and investigating until one reaches um, the terminal and binding solution. And then immortality is incorruption, the inability to decay. Now, all of this allows us to see that righteousness and holiness are a team effort. The Holy Spirit begins this process for us and our willful agreement to seek and stay within the boundaries of sanctification and actively pursue maturing in the word and trying to see where God wants to use us and being open to that, that process keeps us in sanctification. This entire process of being baptized, sanctified, and brought into righteousness by walking in the spirit is summarized super well in Titus 3, 7, um, but we have to look at the original language to see it. So we got Titus 3, 5 through 8. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of the regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These are good and profitable to men. So here we go. Through the channel or the act, like grace, that allows a thing. So what's the channel? Washing, the act of baptism. Regeneration is the state of spiritual renovation of those consecrated to God. A moral and radical change for the better effected in baptism. The restoration of a pristine intended pure state. Renewing is a renewal, a complete change for the better effected by the Holy Spirit. Um, maintain is to be devoted, a proper standing to be well established in character, to provide a model for others to follow by example, taking the lead in diligence, having a respected reputation for something, the excellence of living in faith and having an impressive Christian reputation, and to rule over. You're, re you're ruling over it, okay? Now, good works, accomplishments done with a beautiful outward sign on the inward good good, worthy, honorable character, attractively good that inspires and motivates others to follow what is lovely with one's tasks. These are employments or behaviors that accomplish things. Okay, so clearly the act of regeneration by the Holy Spirit is at baptism. This is a consecration or a setting apart that counts the person as sanctified. Uh, but it has to be from the heart. This is not like the Holy Crusades where people are going town to town and saying, get dumped or die. That's, that's not what we're talking about. The Holy Spirit renews that person continuously. As long as that person does not quench the Holy Spirit or grieve the Holy Spirit, and as long as they are actively reserving scripture, setting our minds toward holiness and being led by the Spirit, then it is also the person's responsibility to do their daily tasks with the leadership mindset. Your daily tasks. The leadership mindset, always aware that they are to be inspiring others around them to also do the things of God and using the gifts that God has given to pour out of them through their efforts so they are living testimony of what Christ looks like and what Christians look like. We have a responsibility to be different, to live better. 2 Corinthians 2, 12, for our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience um, that we conduct ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly toward you. So the testimony is the evidence of proof, the truth of salvation from God to men through Christ. The conscience, testimony of our conscience, the soul that distinguishes between what is morally good and morally bad with a prompt to follow one and condemn and stay clear of the other. 
And then um, we are to live simplicity in simplicity. This is the virtue of one who is free from the presence of hypocrisy, but lives in mental honesty, living in a way that his values speak, not self-seeking, but of the openness of heart and simplicity, honesty and generosity, sharing generously and honestly in a, with a selfless heart. And then living in sincerity, godly sincerity, which is purity, clarity, and well suited for a purpose. We have a purpose. Okay. Now, of course, all of this, the tip of the iceberg, I like, it's so hard to trim all this down, even into this like two hour thing, because it's huge. It's huge. That's why there's an entire Bible. You're supposed to be reading it. Okay. But I hope this has helped you understand really where that sanctification um, piece is. Okay. Um, and that the entire goal of sanctification is to live righteous and holy and walking in the spirit. That's the purpose. So that we can be um, cleansed and okay to be in God's presence, which is the entire point. Now, when we live righteously, then we get to inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so the natural question is, well, what if I haven't been living in right standing with the Lord? What does righteousness look like? How do I know if I'm living in righteousness? I'm going to deal with those in some videos to come. Okay. I just think that step by step, we're going to learn a little more every single video. And um, this should have clarified how God is the same from the Old Testament to Revelation in his regard to sanctification. Okay. So I hope this has helped you. I know it's a way ton of a lot of information. I'm really sorry, but it, it is what it is. Okay. I mean, if we can put God in a box and, and package it all in like a 10 minute video, woohoo, but it's just not reality. It, it's really not reality. So, um, hopefully see you next time.